Thank you, Peter. Um, I'm Robin Priestley with the Ramsey County Historical Society. We want to thank the Eastside Freedom Library and the Roseville Library for being our partners in this History Revealed series. Um, tonight, we have a very special event with McAllister College, and I'll let Peter introduce them in a minute. Um, but first of all, I'd like to thank all our supporters and friends for being here tonight. And if you're not a member of the Ramsey County Historical Society or the Eastside Freedom Library, please consider joining us. We rely on the support of members and friends like you to continue to present oh, these exciting. programs and all of our efforts. And there are some great benefits to joining. Um, you can see all of these on our website, which is www.rchs.com. And then the Eastside Freedom Library, Peter will talk a little bit about that. And um, we have some great programs coming up for the rest of May and throughout the summer on a series that we're talking about called Making Minnesota. So we are exploring the stories of the histories and experiences, some of the worldwide immigrants, African American and indigenous communities that make up Ramsey County this year. And we're really excited about all of these programs. So check out our website and you'll see all the upcoming um, and we're continuing to add more events as we go along. Um, I also want to mention that on May 28th, we'll be opening up our historic site Gibbs Farm for the season, and we have a new book out. And again, that will be on our website. So please join us. Um, we're hoping to be able to see people in person this summer, which will be great. Um, as a reminder, please keep your microphones and personal cameras turned off during the program. Again, this is a semi-hybrid program, and you can put your questions and comments in the chat. We will be able to read those out for the participants to answer later. We would like to acknowledge the sacred Dakota land. Minnesota and Makoche, the land where the waters are so clear they reflect the clouds, is the ancestral and contemporary homeland of the Dakota people. It is also home to the Anishinaabe and other indigenous peoples. The Ramsey County Historical Society acknowledges that its sites are located on and benefit from these sacred Dakota lands. Ramsey County Historical Society is committed to preserving our past informing our present and inspiring our future. Part of doing so is acknowledging the painful history and current challenges facing the Dakota people just as we celebrate the contributions of Dakota and other indigenous people. And again, you can check out our website for our full land acknowledgement statement, which includes actionable ways in which Ramsey County Historical Society pledges to honor the Dakota and other indigenous peoples of Minnesota and Mekoche, including some upcoming history revealed programs. So thank you, Peter and Clarence and everybody at the Eastside Freedom Library. And I'm going to turn it back over to you. Thank you, Robin. Um, I want to just take a moment and thank my colleagues, Bailey Ethier and Taylor Guccione, who are here in the chat. Um, as Robin has created the category for what we're doing, semi-hybrid. Um, so we're trying. And hopefully this is working for you out there. Um, and as Robin said, we do hope to see you all in person at the very least for programs on our front lawn if spring ever comes uh, here in Minnesota. So I'm going to introduce Professor Jesse McFarland, who's going to tell us a bit about how this work got done and who these young people are they represent. Jesse. Well, thank you very much, uh, Peter and Clarence and uh, Bailey and everyone else here in the Eastside Freedom Library family. It's certainly um, a great opportunity for us. We want to thank, of course, Robin, Ramsey County Historical Society, and other partners in the Ramsey 
uh, uh, library system. Um, I just want to maybe make a few additional remarks of acknowledgement and thanks for um, people who made this work happen. As it's often said, research is a collective, collaborative kind of thing. Um, and I think even this project for just a handful of us uh, working on it, we've been buoyed and supported by a number of different people. So I want to just acknowledge a few uh, other efforts. Chris True and his colleagues at the Minnesota Historical Society Gale Family Library have been really helpful to us. What's history without some archives and what's uh, what's collective work without support uh, of that sort? Pete Boulay and Bob Jensen at the Maplewood Area Historical Society helped us out in a variety of ways. Ryan Mackey at the Bortrip Map Library at the University of Minnesota has been important for our work as well and a co-traveler on the project. We also want to thank the faculty, staff, and students of the Department of Geography and McAllister College. We're certainly working within a public-facing geography mode. Let's say uh, civic engagement is um, a value in the Department of Geography at McAllister College, and so we're, we're drawing on that tradition uh, this evening. I thought it'd be useful just to mention the fact that we're in this former Carnegie Library, which has been converted to the purpose of the Eastside Freedom Library. And as it happens, most of the classes of the Department of Geography at McAllister College also take place in a building named after Carnegie. And for me, these are not just, um, I don't know, uh, uh, passing notes, but just a reminder that we inherit landscapes, places, institutions, uh, not necessarily of our own making and are charged um, possibly in a collective research endeavor to make fresh sense out of the past and chart a different course for the future. So it's been a, it's been a great pleasure as a visiting assistant professor of geography at Mac this year to be working with some wonderful talented um, undergrads. And I'd like to um, introduce them here. Um, Ava Strombrin is a senior at McAllister College this year about to graduate. Um, and has been majoring in geography, minoring in political science, um, and is also uh, completing a concentration in human rights and humanitarianism. She's from St. Anthony, Minnesota. Marissa Williamson is a senior geography major and food, agriculture, and society concentrator at McAllister College, originally from Madison, Wisconsin. Also hailing from Madison, Wisconsin is Henry Yackel, majoring in anthropology and geography at McAllister with the, also with a concentration in food, agriculture, and society. And finally, and we'll start off with our first speaker um, in the group, uh, we have Jack Acomb, who is a senior geography major with minors in urban studies and statistics. He was born and raised in Minnesota, living in the Twin Cities most of his life. Thank you. Hi there, everybody. Thanks so much for having us here tonight. We really appreciate the opportunity to present our research to all of you. As Henry or as Jesse said, my name is Jack, and I'll be leading off the beginning of this presentation here for us tonight in this part of the History Revealed series on our research on geographies of the Ramsey County Core Farm from the Minnesota Territory to the New Deal. Next slide, please. So to set the scene for this project. I imagine most of the folks out there in the Zoom room have never heard of the poor farm before, and that's totally fine. Neither have we when we started this project. But to give some, some context about where this institution sits in the county's history, the Ramsey County Poor Farm existed for almost 100 years, and during that time, it housed thousands of Minnesotans. At a statewide level, poor farms housed likely tens of thousands of Minnesotans in dozens of facilities. And nationwide, the family of institutions that included poor houses, almshouses, paupers' asylums, likely housed hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of Americans over their collective histories. Given the breadth and the spatial diversity of this institution, it's quite surprising that it's not something more people have heard about, that it's not part of the discourse about our collective history and our collective governance. And the main thrust of our research here today and our presentation tonight is to reintroduce the poor farm back into those conversations, to provide some context about how this institution existed in the local context of Ramsey County, and hopefully to offer some insight about how we understand this both as a historical institution and in the context of our modern world. Next slide, please. 
So over the course of this semester long research projects, we've had a variety of research questions, but many of them boil down to quite a simple question that we wanted to start off the presentation here tonight with. What was the poor farm? And the answer that we came to was that the poor farm was a poverty relief institution that served the disabled, the sick, and the out of work. This was a county level, county run institution that in the case of Ramsey County existed in Minnesota from 1854 up through the New Deal era in the 1940s. The basic model of the institution was that those who came seeking relief, whether that be housing or food or medical care, would come to the poor farm and live there as residents or as they were often termed inmates. And in exchange for poor relief, they would offer oftentimes for free their labor to the poor farm. So in some cases, this was agricultural labor. In other cases, this was domestic labor, cooking, cleaning, that sort of thing. In any case, this was an evolving institution over its almost 100 year history and served a variety of constituencies over that period. At times, it serves working class men who couldn't afford to care for their families due to illness or lack of work. At other times, it serves women and children who had no other institutions to turn to in that era. At times, it served the elderly and the disabled who had no next of kin to care for them when they were unable to work themselves. That said, this was a complex institution, and this is only scratching the surface of what the poor farm in Ramsey County was. The rest of our presentation here tonight will be providing some additional context from our research about the complexities of this local manifestation of the poor farm. Next slide, please. To offer a bit of a roadmap about where we'll be going for the rest of tonight's presentation, we're going to start with an explanation of our research methodologies that we adopted for this project, about how we learned about poor farms in general and also about the Ramsey County poor farm in particular. We'll then move into a conversation of our contextualization of the institution within the academic literature. From there, we'll address some of our key findings in a variety of different things, um, starting with state level context, and then some uh, thoughts on the variability of governance, health and burial practice, practices, ultimately public perceptions, and then the decline of the poor farm in the end. And we'll conclude tonight's presentation with a discussion on some thoughts about the implications that this, might re this research might have in the modern day. With that, I'd like to hand it over to my colleague, Ava. Thanks, Jack. So we're gonna first talk about our methodology and the sources we used for this research. Um, we used three different primary methods. The first one being archival research at the Gale Family Library, newspaper searching, and a site visit primarily to the fourth and final location of the Ramsey County Poor Farm. I'm gonna go into each of those a little bit more in depth and then discuss some of the limitations of this research. So first, archival research was primarily conducted in person at the Minnesota Historical Society Gale Family Library. Um, this was mainly looking through primary documents, particularly the Board of Control minutes, county commissioner minutes, and other kind of government records relating to this time or personal donated papers. The image that you can see on the right is the inmate registry um, from 1913 to 1916, which is just kind of a small bit of quantitative information from these records. The second method we used was newspaper searching, which was primarily done online and virtually in the Minnesota Historical Society virtual newspaper hub. Um, and this was primarily looking at kind of local English newspapers, as well as a few migration related newspapers, particularly Swedish and German language ones. Um, you can see kind of a full list there. And then on the right is just an example of an article about kind of farmland costs um, from the St. Paul Daily Globe in the early 1900s. And then our third and final method that we used was in-person site visits. Um, so we went to the third side of the poor farm and the fourth and final site. We did spend more time and we have some photos on the right from the fourth Maplewood site, um, which we also walked around with Pete Boule and Bob, um, Bob Jensen from the Maplewood Historical Society. Um, so then on the right is two photos of that. You can see on the far right, the Maplewood barn today, contrasted with that same barn from the 1930s. Awesome. So now I want to talk a little bit about the limitations of these research methods, as well as a note on our positionality. Um, so first for limitations, most of the limitations with this project primarily came from just kind of the inherent nature of archival research. Um, particularly something we found really interesting and learned a lot about in this project is about who has the power to write archives. Um, and the knowledge we have, while we gained a lot of knowledge, is primarily written by the people in power at these times. 
Um, so that can make it really challenging to really fully dive into and reconstruct the day-to-day -day lives of people without power in these institutions, um, particularly people who are inmates there. There's also a limited time length of this project being that it was a semester length project. Um, and then also this kind of connects to a note on our positionality, um, the erasure of the poor farm as a historical institution and a welfare institution does matter, um, especially in a local context. Um, and most of these people were impoverished, a lot of times disabled, a lot of times older white people, um, and a lot of times recent immigrants, and that matters and is inherently valuable. But that's also been a tool that's been used to erase the lives of indigenous people from these lands, um, and also has been used to kind of rewrite that narrative and dispossess people from those lands. Um, so we want to keep both of those narratives and erasures in mind together. But with that, I'll hand it to Henry. Hi there. Um, I wanted to look over some of the literature that we've done this semester that has provided us the intellectual basis for a lot of the work that we have done on the poor farm. Um, next slide. So one of the first themes of our literature that um, we recognize is the moralization of welfare. So we start off with the work of Wagner, who did um, a lot of research on the almshouses of um, New England, which you'll notice is a different name than Poor Farm. And it suggests itself as kind of an inheritor of Christian traditions of welfare and aid and charity. Um, and specifically with the almshouses in New England as an inheritor of this Protestant tradition um, um, that, that essentializes basically those who can work as moral and virtuous and those who for some one reason or another can not as in some way sinful. Um, and so then we work into um, Quigley and we understand how um, that English law actually is really ingrained in a lot of American political structures and a lot of the poor laws um, that have been ingrained into um, American states are based in English poor laws. Um, and so you can kind of get that inheritance of um, penalization of those who cannot work, as we kind of talked about with this almshouse um, institution in New England. Um, but also it's important to notice that there are Midwest kind of variations as there is increasing kind of um, settler colonial expansion out of the Midwest and find new political models um, for the political activities that crop up um, on the colonial frontier. Um, and then Katz, which is a little bit more of a recent read, um, looks at the ways that anti-poverty campaigns have been run throughout U.S. history in the past, and in particular likes to um, critique this um, kind of progressive era um, idea of technocracy and um, kind of a faith and in institution that if you um, elect all the right people and um, pass all the right legislation with the way it relates to some principles like taxes and whatnot, you can kind of fix poverty, and also that there's like lots of problematic racist assumptions that um, a lot of these white progressive reformers kind of brought into their work. And so that's an important thing to acknowledge too as we move forward in um, research of poverty. Next slide. Um, and so then my other large category was understanding um, the creation of poor farms in the context of a Midwest market economy. And so, the work of McClure is good at giving us a um, statewide kind of overview of um, what the poor farm was, kind of structures that different um, counties might have faced in getting their um, poor farms erected if they actually did. Um, and also kind of brought up this constant struggle that the poor farm is a welfare institution, but people also want it to make money or cost as little money as possible. Basically, that there's not a political will for a project that won't, in some way, shape, or form, be profitable. Um, and so then um, I connect that to the work that we brought from Willis, who describes how the opening of land markets um, on the banks of the Mississippi were integral in providing um, the flows of capital and of particular individuals to provide by like the political willpower for creation of things like the Ramsey County and the creation of a Minnesota territory. Um, how basically the ability for people to buy land and settle on it is what's driving the creation of um, counties and state structures. Next slide. 
Um, and so then it's just kind of continuing along the theme of how the Polar Farm is kind of a result of the evolution of Ramsey County in the context of market economy. We talk about um, the role that um, poor farms kind of played more informally for, um, you look at the work of Burke, how um, poor farms and um, many places throughout the state might have been kind of informal um, residents or shelters for um, temporary um, summer rural work or summer um, work on farms. And so like seasonal work that then in the winter kind of recedes. So you see that there's like this, even though there's this kind of throughout the history of the poor farm, there's a really um, fraught relationship about who gets to be admitted. And there's kind of a lot of concern raised about is the institution wasting resources on people. It seems like it did have this role as kind of like an informal place for people to be able to stay and get care if they really needed it. Um, and also the work of Burke reminds us that um, there are lots of immigrant um, populations coming to these poor farms, um, lots of non-English-speaking populations in these poor farms. Um, and it kind of just reminds us to, um, it just kind of helps us imagine this space as a space of marginalized peoples. Um, and then finally, um, we looked a little bit at the work of Sarah Riley, um, who did a master's thesis at the University of Minnesota um, and provided us a comprehensive kind of statistical overview of um, poor farms as they were in kind of like the mid 20th century at this tipping point, right before um, poor farms largely fell off the map. Um, yeah, next slide. And so this is another um, really big um, part of what the poor farm was, is its relationship to um, federal government, states, and counties. Um, and for a long time during the settling of the um, territory of Minnesota, there was kind of this question of would welfare be something done by like towns or would that be done by these larger county structures that we've created? Um, and so um, the kind of that question eventually becomes answered um, throughout the early history of the um, Minnesota Territory. Um, there was lots of institutional kind of creations that Ramsey County was pioneering, things like having an overseer of the poor um, that eventually was adopted by legislature passed by the state of Minnesota. Basically what I mean by this is that there's lots of in administrative innovations in regards to welfare um, and like a, a specific idea about a poor farm as a way to um, help people in need that was eventually came through as being the um, kind of suggested way that counties deal with their um, poor population by like Minnesota legislation and showing the influence of that county structure. Um, next slide. And I'll pass it back to Jack. Thanks, Henry. Hi, Devin. Hi again, everyone. As we move into some of the findings of our research in earnest, one of the things that we were able to really get our hands around thinking about some of the limitations of our archival source material was the history of the physical movements of the institution of the poor farm. Tracking that history was one of the key thrusts of our research. And as you can see in this map on the right hand of the slide here, we've done our best to plot out those movements over time. So this map illustrates the four major movements of the poor farm around the county during its almost 100 year history. And as you can hopefully see, there were four primary locations that the institution inhabited during that time. I'll be providing a little bit of context on each of those four locations now. Next slide, please. So the first location of the Ramsey County Poor Farm was in what was then known as Mounds View Township and is today known as the city of Shoreview. In 1854, the Ramsey County Board of County Commissioners purchased this plot of land just to the west of Snail Lake for the purposes of founding the first Ramsey County Poor Farm. Now, this was, as mentioned previously, prior to Minnesota statehood, but it was also prior to a number of important county level developments as well. So the poor farm was founded prior to the Ramsey County Jail or prior to the Ramsey County Prison, prior to the Ramsey County Hospital. And in fact, the Ramsey County Poor Farm was only the second residential institution founded in the entire state of Minnesota. So this was extremely important in the eyes of this fledgling Ramsey County government and perhaps speaks to the, the importance and priorities of 
this colonial territorial government. That said, there's not much information available about this site in particular. It was only in, uh, in place in Moundsview Township for approximately five years. And so it's unclear to what degree, if at all, farming or coal relief actually took place at this location. Next slide, please. In 1857, the uh, Ramsey County Poor Farm was moved from where it was previously to McLean Township, which is in modern day St. Paul, right along the Mississippi River in what is today Pig's Eye Lake uh, Regional Park. This, like its previous location, is also relatively poorly documented, but there's a couple of key points that we wanted to highlight for you all. To start, this was the first location of the poor farm that has solid cartographic evidence for its existence. Previous locations had textual evidence and things like county minutes, but this is the first time we have a map that actually shows the poor farm's location. And you can see that in the upper right hand corner there. In addition, this location was proximate to what was known as the Ramsey County Pest House. And for those who don't know, pest houses were another type of mid 19th century uh, colonial institution whereby individuals who became sick with communicable diseases, so things like smallpox, for example, were quarantined in these buildings to keep them away from the general population so that diseases wouldn't spread. However, it's maybe telling that this quarantine location was located immediately next to the location where the county's poor would be housed. Next slide, please. Ultimately, the poor farm would be moved yet again to, in this case, the other side of St. Paul in what was then Rose Township, and today is the Como neighborhood of St. Paul. A couple notable things about this location. This was the first time that the poor farm was located proximate to other county development. So this was immediately proximate to primary railroad lines, the Hamlin University, to the homes and farms of several large, wealthy political families that inhabited the county at the time. It's also the first site where we have strong textual evidence to support the existence of agricultural activity. It's likely that some agriculture was happening at these previous locations, but in terms of residents performing agriculture on the poor farm, this is the first place we have solid evidence. And of perhaps most note to the individuals in the crowd tonight, in 1850, 1885, excuse me, this plot of land was donated for free to the Minnesota State Agricultural Society, which would then for the next hundred years, use this land as the, the site of the Minnesota State Fairgrounds. And to this day, in fact, that's where the fair is held every year. I imagine most folks have been to the fairgrounds. There isn't almost any recognition that this was once used as a poor relief location or that that's the legacy of the land, but that is, that, that is in fact the case for this site. Next slide, please. Finally, in 1885, the fourth and final location of the poor farm uh, was opened in the town of Maplewood. This was the final site that would exist up through the New Deal era until the poor farm's abolition. And it was also the longest span of time that the poor farm was in one place, almost 70 years up through the 1940s. It was a significant investment on the part of the county to open this location with large scale barns and facilities intended to supplement the agricultural capacity of the institution. And at the time of its creation, it was heralded as a model institution, both around the states and around the country. You can see a newspaper rendition of what the buildings might have looked like um, from 1885 in the right hand corner. It sounded like from some of the messages in the chat that some folks might be familiar with this location. It is in fact true that some of the buildings on that site are still in place today. They're protected as historical sites. But another portion of that land was ultimately converted to what is now the Ramsey County Nursing Home which some folks might be familiar uh, with now that it is now ultimately permanently closing or it's in the process of that as we speak in fact. Um, so that's just the final evolution of that site's public land use. So that's the overall trajectory of the, the timeline and the locations of the Ramsey County Port Farm. Next slide, please. To talk about some of the implications that these rapid movements had on governments. The Ramsey County Poor Farm was something that was in almost a constant state of flux from very early on in its history. And this was due to a variety of factors. One of the key elements of this is that locations, or excuse me, positions within leadership of Ramsey County Poor Farm administration and oversight were seen as career opportunities for local political hopefuls. Folks were coming in often as a way to boost their career with sites set higher in county or, or regional government. Especially in this early era, the first few sites, 
leadership turnover was extremely frequent, almost on an annual basis, in fact. And it wasn't until several decades in that individuals started to stay in positions of leadership for more than two or three years. This meant that administration of the poor farm was frequently changing, but also the lived experiences for the people who were residents of the poor farm was likely in flux almost annually during these early years. As time progressed and state level and county level regulation institutions uh, emerged, the poor farm became more consistent. So things like 10 years of leadership positions tended to increase from one year to several years, reforms to reduce malpractice were introduced, et cetera. But in any case, there was this sense that the variability of the lived experience likely changed a lot year to year or decade to decade over this 100 year history. And one of the most explicit ways in that, that this is demonstrated is the variability in how individuals themselves arrived at the poor farm in the first place. Sometimes individuals would arrive at the poor farm by choice, seeking out for relief from poverty when they had nowhere else to turn. But other times in the institution's history, it was primarily individuals who were sent there by court order due to vagrancy or due to concerns about mental illness, et cetera. Um, the variation and even this fundamental building block of who was making up the institution and how they were getting there is, is illustrative in the, the variation that the institution experienced. Next slide, please. However, despite this variability, there are a couple important through lines we can draw through the institution's history. One of those was the fact that leadership was almost always drawn from local political leaders. And in the case of Ramsey County, this meant landed business owning white men. In almost every case, these people didn't reflect the individuals who would have been living as residents on the poor farm and quite likely would have created a division in the priorities of the leadership versus the needs of the individuals who were living there. Another key element of the leadership ideology, in addition to some of the moralizing components that were discussed earlier, was this view that the poor farm was an opportunity to reduce costs for the county. It was widely believed that the poor farm, or excuse me, that poor relief was a strong economic burden on the county's budget. And that by concentrating people geographically into one building and using their labor to support themselves, the overall cost of poor relief could be reduced and those funds could be used for other county projects. In either case, there was a clear distinction between the priorities of the leadership and perhaps the needs or interests of the people living in those institutions. And this manifested itself in what we term as individuals using the poor farm strategically. So what we mean by this is that individuals in some cases and as they were able would come to the poor farm perhaps a few weeks, a few months when they were in their most need, but then once they'd gotten back on their feet would leave again. And this went strongly against some of the moralizing elements of the leadership philosophy of, of the time, but perhaps speaks clearly to the divides in what was being offered and what was needed by the, the people that were intended to use this facility. Next slide, please. And I'll pass it off to my colleague, Marissa. Another large money saving venture that we see being discussed on the subject of the poor farm was burials. So when looking at some of the Ramsey County Board of Commissioner meetings, at a meeting specifically in 1894, we see a lot of complaints about everyone's talking about, oh, it's so expensive to bury the county poor. So that would be residents of the poor farm, but this would also be unclean bodies that they found throughout Ramsey County. And at the meeting, a month later, they soon decided on April 2nd, 1894, that they should build a potter's field on the grounds of the Maplewood, on the Maplewood poor farm. Um, so they decided to make the potter's field north of the main buildings, um, near the Wisconsin Central Railroad tracks and near White Bear Avenue. For the next 30 years, we see people who died in Ramsey County where no one claimed their body were buried there. Um, this kind of gives us a little insight on how the elite and the board viewed these residents of the poor farm. Um, they didn't believe in giving them a true burial. They just thought to bury them in a kind of mass grave. And the potter's field and Maplewood 
does not have any grave markers and all the graves are fairly shallow. So this kind of shows us that the elite and the board viewed the people as less than. They didn't think they needed to give them the respect or dignity of being buried in a cemetery. But so now we move on to who is in the potter's field and why. So as I said earlier, you know, for around 30 years, people are getting buried in this potter's field. Um, thanks to a large data entry project published in 1998 called the Ramsey County's Forgotten Cemetery done by Mary Bakeman and Richard Premier Swanson, we have legible records of who was buried in this potter's field. Looking a bit at the um, demographics, we can see that there is around 3,000 bodies that are in this potter's field. Um, out of those bodies, around 2,000 were identified as male and around 850 were identified as female. Throughout these entries, only 87 people were defined as people of color. And this statistic seems kind of confusing, um, but only 700 were recorded as being born in the US. Um, we get this because people's nationalities are listed on the, um, um, in these records. And that doesn't necessarily mean that the person was from this country, born in this country, it just means that they identified with that group or were categorized into that group. So we don't really know exactly how many were born in the US. Um, looking at the statistics even more, we can see that common causes of death were tuberculosis, pneumonia, heart disease. And another very interesting aspect of um, this data is that around a third of the people that are buried in this potter's field are infants and stillborn babies. And the rest, the two thirds are um, poor farm residents and unclaimed bodies. So when you go to this area today, um, you don't really see a mass grave. Um, it is divided into multiple spaces. Um, it is a, part of it is a horseshoe court, part of it is paved. And then there is a small part that's like natural area that has a plaque um, that talk, thanks to the Maplewood Historical Society that talks about how this was a mass grave. Um, when you're looking around, you don't really realize that you're standing on the bodies of 3000 people. Um, a little note, Ramsey County is doing a research project on this potter's field, and they're looking into maybe doing um, a commemoration to these people that are buried here. Um, slide. So again, from the archives, as Ava was talking about, we only can really know a lot about how the elite viewed the residents of this poor farm and people in power viewed it. Um, but so a way to try to tell um, if we're, what the public thought about the situation is we were doing a lot of looking in newspaper archives um, and we're just, you know, it's hard to tell what popular public sentiment was about because the poor farm existed for hundreds <laughs> of years. Okay, and um, so we don't really know exactly what people thought about the situation. We've read things in newspaper archives and also in the literature that talks about how it was a really shameful thing to have to go to the poor farm, to not be able to work for yourself or provide for yourself and people were very ashamed of it. Um, but we don't know that this was the general consensus for the entire time. Um, but while we were looking through the newspaper archives, we found a really great quote that was talking about what to do with this poor farm land um, after they were going to sell and close the poor farm, like what should we do with it? And the issue was that there is a mass grave on the land. Um, so before they were talking about this, um, in this article from the White Bear Press in 1944, they decided to give this little um, introduction. And it is, um, it is a disgrace to the county to bury even paupers in that plot of land. It is very rough right alongside the barnyard in a miserable layout. The only good thing about it is the devil would never look for a person there. Slide.
So as Marissa said, the potter's field and the poor farm as associated with the potter's field as kind of neglectful and disrespectful burial practices really became the focal point of these broad reform efforts kind of in the early to mid 20th century. Many politicians at this time, such as MJ Carr, who the two ads on the right are for, ran on platforms of kind of reform, change, or evolution of the poor farm as an institution um, and then ending disrespectful burial practices such as the potter's field with that. Um, a lot of them also tied these into kind of broader ideals of the time relating to less racial segregation um, in public systems, as well as kind of more inclusive social welfare systems and institutions as a whole. Thus, we can kind of take this to be significant and exemplary of the shift at the time in public perception and kind of societal understandings of best welfare practices. We really see the poor farm go from what was considered to be kind of the creme de la creme practice of the time to go really out of style. You start being seen with the potter's field as disrespectful, unjust, not with the times anymore, which really ultimately contributed to the evolution away from the poor farm into kind of other welfare institutions. I'll pass it to Henry to talk more about that. Thanks, Brian. Um, and so as Ava mentioned, this kind of brings us to wonder, what are the conditions that led us to not have the poor farm today? Why are they not part of our social fabric today? Um, and so we can look at a lot of factors, but a huge one is that this isn't, the poor farm is a solution, especially when it's won by counties, isn't a great solution for rural areas simply because there isn't necessarily the manpower to run these institutions or the resources to build the infrastructure necessary for them. Um, or that there might just not even be any um, inhabitants in these programs. They might not be serving care to anybody. Like what's the point of that then? Um, but then it really um, was starting to go on decline with the advent of the federal welfare state. Um, in the after the Great Depression, the rise of FDR and the Media Coalition, which is a radical expansion of federal direct aid that just previously did not exist in the same capacity. That used to basically be the county's job to survive welfare, but it suddenly became the federal government and did it with um, radical programs like Social Security that provided at home direct aid. Um, and so you have this combination of these factors that um, reduce the need to have a centralized place where you put your poor people and gave them care because there were no ways of giving at home aid that worked through different political structures than the um, than the poor farm did. Um, and the impact of this was pretty immediate, actually. Um, from 1934 to 1942, there was a pretty precipitous drop in uh, number of poor farms across the state and having um, and you kind of see instantly how uh, Talking more about the legacy of the poor farm. So where do we see parts of the poor farm today? Um, when we were all thinking about this, one of the first things that came to mind for us was the carceral system. The whole concept of a poor farm is that you are supposed to do all the labor to pay your own costs of the county taking care of you. And so we can see a direct connection of this with prison labor, with people being forced to do work for little to no money just because they are part of an institution. Um, another really large connection we can see from the poor farm has to do with poverty, addiction, and mental health institutions. To receive care like this, you often have to physically go to a place or stay in an area to get this kind of um, help and support that you need. Um, another direct connection that we can see is with elder care facilities. Um, by the end of the poor farm in Ramsey County, it was largely an elder care facility, even when it was still the poor farm, with the majority of people being older people. Um, we can see again this direct link having to physically go to elder care centers, having to be a part of them to receive this aid and this help. And additionally, as we said earlier, the Ramsey County Care Center is on the grounds of the poor farm. Um, 
And one of the biggest things that um, we kind of take away from this really big legacy is that the lives of thousands of people were forgotten from this institution. Um, we don't know their stories. We never will. Um, we don't know their livelihoods. We don't know how they ended up on the poor farm. We don't know their experiences. They were viewed as less than and not worthy of having their stories saved and recorded because they were poor. But. So what are we doing next? Like, what are we doing with this research and this project? Um, we are in the process of making a website. Um, it is still under construction right now, but it is poorfarmgeography.net. And here we're gonna have all of our slides, images, research, and we're also working on a larger data entry project that has to do with digitizing and recording all of the um, Ramsey County Almshouse Register of Inmates. So everyone that was recorded as being a part of the poor farm um, from a certain time period. Uh, next. Yeah, these are just some of our main primary sources. Next. And yeah, we just wanna say thank you for having us. And we'll leave you with some images, um, starting with a image of the Ramsey County Alms House in 1909. And then also an image of a poor farm, a resident of a poor farm, Duke Rana, working on a project in the poor farm. Thank you again. Well, hopefully uh, you're out there applauding uh, for this wonderful work by these students. Um, it's really great uh, for them to be taking our community seriously and bringing our history to us. Um, we did get some questions that came in um, and I'm gonna start by sharing some of those questions and then hopefully Robin, you can uh, communicate additional questions. Um, so another geography prophet, McAllister, Bill Mosley, uh, asks, um, was farm labor preferred over other types of labor? Um, with, and I'm wondering whether any of you would like to grab the microphone and respond. Henry, I saw you nodding your head, and Ava. Oh, okay. Okay, I think we're all gonna stand up here, but I can start answering Bill's question. Um, so on the first point, I don't know if I would use the word preferred, but I would say maybe like encouraged. Most of the people were middle to older age, like 40 to 60 or 70 year old men. Um, so it did seem like there was a gender skew towards outdoor physical labor. Um, but there is a few records of like women or sometimes outside workers being hired. Um, to do more um, domestic, for lack of a better word, labor. And then on the second point, a lot of the produce um, in some records, at least in later years, was sold to other county institutions. Um, so there's some record of the poor farm produce being um, given to nearby hospitals or um, kind of other similar institutions locally in that vein. Um, so yeah. Another question was uh, whether you know if inmates of the poor farm were buried in other places besides the potted fields. Can you put the question in there? Yes. Thank you. Yeah, so the question was if we know that um, residents of the poor farm, if they were buried in other places. And yes, we do know that. Um, in the County Board of Commissioners, uh, we read about how they used to buy plots of land from local cemeteries. So we saw mentions of Oakland Cemetery and Calvary Cemetery, Cemetery. And yeah, they would spend hundreds of dollars a year on these cemetery plots to bury poor farm residents and other unclaimed bodies from Ramsey County. Is, is Robin the transmitting any questions? I can 
I can do that, Peter. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, uh, Krista, for those of you who are online, had a question about putting the poor farm um, burials up on find a grave, and she did find that. Um, so that link is in the chat. Thank you, Krista. Um, and there was a question from Laura. Um, if there were burials at any of the other locations that you noted, um, she was particularly interested in the state fair location. Sure. So it's possible that burials were taking place at one of these other three locations. The fact of the matter is, is that records of burials during those periods are nowhere near as complete as they were during the Maplewood era. So it's hard for us to say for certain. Of course, these bodies had to be buried somewhere. And if they weren't in one of these local cemetery pots, it's very possible that they were on the grounds of what would become the state fair. We can't say with any certainty either way, though, um, unfortunately, due to the limitations of the archival source material. Thanks. Thanks for that answer. Um... Let's see. Oh, Sarah so, had a question. I'd like to ask a question um, as a kind of nerdy historian researcher. Um, I spent a lot of time digging through the manuscript census of population uh, decade by decade. Um, those records are sealed for 75 years, so we can only go back so far. Have you tried to find the inmates before they show up at the poor farm to get a sense of their family situation, their employment, their marital status, their education, all kinds of things that a manuscript sense tell you. And I'll tell you, it's a ton of work, but I, I, I wonder if you've tried to do any of that kind of thing. So the question, in case folks didn't hear online, was whether we looked into various other types of recorded um, data sources to try and get a sense of where the people who would end up ultimately in the poor farm were coming from. And the answer is yes, but. As was alluded to in the question, this is a ton of work. And the capacity for people to do that kind of digging on any sort of um, complete basis is, is extremely limited. That said, we do have some sort of anecdotal cases where we do have a sense of where these people are coming from. So uh, for instance, individuals would appear before county boards to appear, apply for entry into the poorhouse during particular eras. And during those application processes would provide information about their family situations, if they were bringing any children with them, if they had any other dependents, things like that. So we do have records of, of individual cases where, for instance, a single mother, has two children and her Asian mother um, with her and is applying to the poor farm for relief in, in that way. We can't speak to the broader trends in that sense, but there are a few anecdotal cases. Thank you. So uh, that, that leads to- Carolyn asks in the chat, what do you know about poor farms elsewhere in Minnesota besides Ramsey? Um, yeah, so I can tackle that a little bit. Um, a lot of our work was spe um, focused specifically on the um, kind of history of Ramsey County and its different locations. Um, so I wouldn't say our knowledge is extensive. I think a lot of the work we've done is kind of understanding some of the kind of political history, economic history that, like, you know, like statewide legislation that um, kind of determines. Um, the structures of how poor farms function. And we do know a little bit that um, there were a lot of rural areas where poor farms kind of stalled out extra quick just because there were no people in these institutions um, that they were just unutilized in certain rural areas. Um, but again, we don't have any, at least me, me personally, I, think I don't have any personal um, instances to point to about alternative um, stories about poor farms. And just a quick additional note on that question about uh, poor farms that existed <laughs> elsewhere in Minnesota. One of the other details I remember is that St. Louis County, um, where Duluth is located, 
had a particularly large core farm that was at times larger than the Ramsey County one. And the makeup and operation of that institution was quite different. That would be a whole different research project, but there were other large scale institutions in at least the large cities in Minnesota too. It also occurs to me that a while back we had a presentation, and I'm embarrassed I'm forgetting the name of the author who had written a book about her grandmother being sent to a quote unquote home for unwed mothers as another, I think, form of the way issues of, of poverty and control. We're getting lots of stuff in the chat of people sending you congratulations and thank you. And, um, you should know that people really appreciate the work you do there. Uh, Robin, do you have any other questions there? Sure. There was a question from Sarah. Um, were you able to talk to any poor, poor farm residents or their families or um, their descendants at all? Or, do, or are there any plans to do that? The short answer would be no. Um, based on the length of the semester and kind of the missing pieces, like there are records, but there's a lot of missing pieces. Um, they're also all in very aggressive cursive. Some of them are ripped, some of them are fading. Like the ability that we have um, to even read those at this time is like a lot of a lot of um, transcribing them online and that kind of thing. So as of this point, we haven't. Um, it's also important to note that there's probably not many people, I would venture to say, if any, who are alive who lived on the latest iteration of the Ramsey County Poor Farm. It ended in the basically right in the middle of the 19th century. So especially considering that most of the people at that time were elders. A little unlikely that they'd still be around. Um, descendants, maybe, um, but we honestly haven't found a lot of records, um, minus like very specific individual anecdotal cases of people's children being in that institution. I mean, a lot of the people in that institution didn't have other familial structures or other community structures in place. Um, so that's kind of an inherent burden of this research. And we have read some other research from other projects, particularly from um, poor, poor, poor farms, poor houses, almshouses on the East Coast, though, um, in secondary academic sources where people have interviewed um, like children of overseers or that kind of thing. Um, but obviously, that's still at times problematic as it's still the people in power. So I would say short answer, no, um, but mainly because of the limitations. Great, thank you for that. Um, there's a related question. Were the residents of the poor farm listed in the census? So what we do know is that it honestly really depended on the sort like the context of what poor farm was at. So I mean, like, was the administration of the poor farm like effective? I mean, like what geographical location in the part of the country was it in? Um, I mean, these are all things that might impact like diet and access to healthcare. I mean, is it in a rural or more urban setting, um, especially with healthcare in regards to like how approximate Oh, um, close to a hospital are you? Um, and I think like amongst well-run poor houses, I think the idea was there was lots of talk about um, keeping inmates, as they were called, like clean. So I think it was like, you know, like fresh clothing, like constantly um, taking care of their hygiene. It was the idea of like this institution is trying to like, rehabilitate these people. Um, and I mean, in terms of diet, it again, that's something that was pretty circumstantial and depended. I mean, we've seen receipts that say things pretty generic, like cabbage, carrots, cream, beef. I mean, like they were raising a lot of their own food, depending on if they were like effectively running poor farms. So, I mean, I know it's not super satisfying to say it depends, but um, it was really very really, yeah. 
Thank you. Please go ahead. Oh please. yeah. Well, when we also went on our uh, poor farm field trip, um, we got some fun anecdotes from Pete Boulay and Bob Jensen from the Minnesota Historical or Maplewood Historical Society. So there were some ideas that like the poor farm was like very like segregated between men and women. Like that was a very thing they were like big thing they were proud of that like men and women slept in very different areas. And we also there's also this fun little story about. Everyone on the poor farm got their own plot of land, and then they all chose to grow tobacco in it um, so they could smoke, which is fun. I know. It gives you some insight. Um, yeah, we hear other stories, too, about, yeah, poor farms in, like, Wisconsin and other places, drinking being a big cultural thing. Um, yeah, it just, it was super variable and very different during all of the different time periods, too. There's also a question about uh, whether people saw the poor farm as a model for other kinds of institutions. Uh, were there things implemented or experimented with there um, that showed up in other kinds of public run institutions? Give a stab at it. Um, the answer is yes and no. As mentioned, the poor farm has a lot of roots in some of these other residential type institutions and shares a lot of uh, key design elements with them. So these sort of ideological underpinnings about promoting hygiene, as discussed earlier, um, having regimented rules within the institution to keep individuals in line, things like that were adopted from previous institutions and carried on through future residential institutions to things like homeless shelters, um, other poor relief institutions. That said, the style of the poor farm went out of style, as was sort of discussed in that New Deal era, where keeping people housed in one location wasn't ultimately seen as the most effective way to administer relief. And that wouldn't really recover for a number of decades following the abolition of the poor farm. So it's hard to say that we have a direct, direct follow-on institution. Um, yeah, that's the long and short of it. Thank you. Um, I want to thank Barb Kirkpatrick Gold, who has sent me in the chat that the book whose author and title I couldn't remember is Kim Heikola and the book Booth Girls. So if you're interested in reading about how unwed mothers were policed and, um, and, and uh, turned into inmates, um, take a look at Kim Heikola's book, Booth Girls. Um, other, anything else, Jesse? Uh, so um, who is? Jerry has, has put in the chat um, that it seems like statistically um, a lot of the bodies in the potter's field are children. Um, and did you think about that? And does that strike you as indicative of something or particularly problematic? Or... Well, I think initially it was just very jarring because we knew about the existence of this potter's field. We knew that it was on the poor farm's grounds. We knew that people from the poor farm were buried there, but kind of reading that statistic was like a little frightening almost, like just the fact that it was so many like babies specifically. Um, but when you look at it and when you read more kind of from this project um, where they were cataloging everything, it's a lot of these babies are dying, you know, things that babies die from, like, you know, instant death. <laughs> um, Sorry, that was not a great way to explain that. Um, and also a lot of like malnutrition and dehydration were actually really big things too. Um, but another big thing is a lot of these babies like did have names. So the majority of them weren't just like babies that were like left places. It was people that didn't, couldn't afford to bury their children. But yeah, so it's like very sad. Um, yeah, and just kind of a very... I think a very 
unique part of this history. There were some um, other mentions about, um, Peter mentioned that there were some rare occasions when people grew up during later years of the poor farm. There were some sisters that he thought were there. Um, there was a question, another question, if I can find it. Oh, um, were the, do you know if the poor farm residents would be in the census records? Right, so the question was, do, do the poor farm residents show up in the in the census record? They ought to. <laughs> um, they were in a public institution, so it was likely that they would have been counted as part of that government process. There were, as discussed in some of the earlier sections, a rash of unclaimed bodies that would come up um, often of poor people around the county. And it's much more likely that those people would go uncounted. But these people who were institutionalized likely would have been tracked closely enough to be counted in that. I can't speak for certain having seen the census records or anything, but that's my understanding. It, it makes me think of um, if you've watched episodes of Henry Louis Gates's Finding Your Roots and, and when he's working with an African-American and they look at the so-called slave schedules in the census and people's names aren't given, just their age. Um, so the, I think there's so much that's revealed about the values of, a, of an era in, in looking at these kinds of records. Um, I'm also very struck by the value of doing this kind of research as a group whether it's making sense out of somebody's handwriting uh, or developing an argument or an interpretation of, of what you're seeing. Um, and, and I think too much academic scholarship is done on the individual model rather than collectively. And it, it's, I'm really appreciating what you were able to accomplish because you had worked together uh, rather than each working individually. Maybe you want to say anything about, like, did you get closer together or did you get pissed at each other or how did your group process work in doing this research? I think that I don't want to speak for everyone, but I think we all vibe with each other. <laughs> I think though, I think it was really good because like most of us haven't taken a lot of classes together before. And I also think that at least, at least for myself, I haven't done a lot of this kind of research before. And so I think everyone being able to kind of bring different things also just in terms of like some people going to the archives, some people doing more virtual research has been really convenient as well. Does anyone want to add anything? I think another thing with this, like specifically talking about the poor farm is it's like a lot of really dark and like sad stuff. And it can be like a lot to just go into an archive and look at thousands of rows of just people that are dead that again, you're never gonna know about. It can be like really jarring for yourself. So I think like having people to kind of like process that with and kind of like talk about our own experiences, like thinking about the lives of these people and trying to figure out how to honor and respect them. It's so great to have a team to like discuss that with and empathize with each other. Thank you. Um, Barb has put in the chat that uh, Ramsey County History Magazine has had several articles about the poor farm, uh, one in the summer 1990 and again, summer 2000. Um, and I know that they're making all the issues of their magazine available through their website. So I don't know whether you guys looked at those, you did, looked at those articles, but people who are on this tonight can also find more information there as well. Well, Professor McClellan, anything you wanna say in, in closing? <laughs> It was just important to me tonight to let these people have the floor. We've been talking and working on this a lot, reading a lot, writing together. 
more writing, as was mentioned, is coming to a website still in progress. But the combination of primary and secondary data we've gone through, these people have done an enormous amount of work. It's been a real pleasure. Um, kind of, I've been thinking of myself more as a coach than a professor in this process. So I'm learning alongside them, trying to more fully develop this um, over the long term. So people can stay tuned to this website um, that we are still in the process of, of putting up. There's a lot more work to come. Um, I couldn't let it pass. I just had a note that one of the people in the chat is Megan Burke. And uh, Megan is a historian, um, currently based in Texas, but with Midwest, Midwestern roots. And uh, just um, in the month of April this year has produced um, a fascinating book um, about poor farms called The Fundamental Institution. We have found not a lot of great book length or in-depth in work um, on poor farms. When we have found such work, it's coming from historians. It's coming from people interested in social care and elder care institutions. So we would just recommend maybe, uh, I will recommend, I don't know if it about We'll recommend um, Ethel McClure's wonderful book length uh, work published by Minnesota Historical Society in the 1960s, uh, More Than a Roof, it's called, which is the only book length treatment specific to Minnesota. Um, David Wagner's historic, historical book, um, which more looks like at the Northeast of the United States. And then finally, Megan Burke, um, a brand new book, The Forgotten Institution, a really thoughtful treatment, um, which draws on some Minnesota and, and Midwestern uh, dynamics. So I think geographies of the poor farm, public facing geographies are a little late to the game, but we have maybe much to contribute to these uh, considerations. So it's just, um, it's just with that kind of, with that kind of angle that we wanted to, to approach the project, adding in. Yeah. Thank you. And I, I do want to report that Megan Burke has just put in the chat um, that she's so impressed with the work that the four of you have done. And so it's great. It's great. It's it's great to have you here, and it's it's great to learn from you. And I think that part of our thinking of ourselves at the East Side Freedom Library is that we're a place where knowledge gets produced, not just accessed. It's great to have four young knowledge producers in our midst tonight. Um, and I don't know if you were watching, but there were like ninety six people tonight so now now you know you can but you survived it thank you everyone um please please continue to join us for history revealed um there will be lots more programs co-sponsored by Eastside freedom library ramsey county historical society and the ramsey county public library system and again i want to thank my colleagues bailey and taylor uh, for their work with the tech if it worked, it's their fault. Um, they get the credit. Thank you, everyone. Stay safe, stay well.